Hey friends, welcome back. Today is Wednesday, so you know what that means, right? It's time for another episode of Weird History. Who never knew? You need to know. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the Roswell incident, but we are going to get real specific in this incident. We're not going to talk about the entire thing. Today, I want to talk about one little tiny subsection, which is the timeline that the potential survivors were out in the desert. Real quick before we get started, if you have not already subscribed to my channel, please hit that subscribe button. And if you like this kind of content, be sure to hit the like button too. Okay, so let's get back into it. Recently, my family and I took a trip to Roswell, New Mexico. I've been really fascinated by the thought that there could be alien life out there. But the question is, is has that intelligent life ever been on Earth? right? That's the question. When I went to Roswell, I went with a very, um, I went with an open mind, but also with a critical mind. So I wanted to really look at what was presented and then see if I could find an argument for it. If you want to see more of that Roswell trip, that is going to be released this Friday on Weird Places You Never Knew You Need to Go. So be sure to check that out. I'm going to get into more of the Roswell trip in that video. But today I want to talk to you guys about the timeline of the Roswell incident in 1947. I don't think I've ever really done a deep dive um, personally or have really researched the, the, the things that transpired during that event. So I always kind of assumed that when the UFO or weather balloon, whatever, when that incident happened, I, I think I just kind of assumed that the police and the military were out there immediately. And what I found on my trip is that that is actually not true. And that if there, if you believe that there were beings out there that the one that was supposedly alive was out there for almost a week. Yeah, a week. So so today's video is just going to be kind of about the initial timeline of the crash because I think it's really fascinating and no one presents this very clearly. So I had no idea that the process of discovering this event and investigating this event took quite some time. A lot of the information that I'm going to be presenting in today's video, I got from this book. It is Cover Up at Roswell. This book is written by Donald R. Schmidt. I will leave this linked um, in the info box or the description box down below. Donald R. Schmidt is actually one of the co-founders of the International UFO Museum in Roswell, New Mexico. He has spent a lot of his life researching this and so this was a really good reference um, I wanted when I went through the museum they present so much information so I kept saying as we were walking through like I wish I had a book that had all of this information in it so that I could like take it home and spend time reading it and then when we were done going through the museum we went to the gift shop and lo and behold they had a book this was the most comprehensive as far as like putting together a timeline and just kind of the basics of what occurred so this this is kind of like the museum but in a book so if you're interested in this definitely check this book out let's get into the story now so most of us are familiar that in July of 1947 there was something that happened out in the deserts of Roswell New Mexico on Tuesday July 1st 1947 radar facilities in Roswell Albuquerque White Sands and Alamogordo track what they call unknowns that appear to defy conventional characteristics. The rate of speed, acceleration, and maneuverability suggests something beyond conventional capabilities. So there were reports out in this general area of these unidentified flying objects. They didn't know what they were. So July 1st, we have all of these UFO sightings or unknowns and no one's sure what's going on. Wednesday, July 2nd, 1947, at 9.50 p.m., a Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Wilcox observe an oval-shaped object like two inverted saucers facing mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, passing over their home in Roswell, heading northeast. At 11 p.m. on that same day, July 2nd, 1947, 65 miles northwest of Roswell, W.W. Mac Brazel hears something that sounds like an explosion. It gets his attention. There were also other witnesses to this event. They included William Moody and his father, 
Mother Superior Mary Bernadette and Sister Capistrano of St. Mary's Hospital, and Corporal E.L. Piles on the flight line at the Roswell Army Field. They all observe a flaming object in the sky that's just shooting across the sky, right? And it's in this arc that's headed out of town. On Thursday, July 3rd, 1947, the morning after the storm, Brazel gets on horseback and he goes out to examine the farm. So he's a foreman of this farm. He does not own the, the farm. He's the one who takes care of the ranch for the people who own it. The people who own it don't live on the property. So he's there to take care of it. And this is 1947. So I had to really put that in perspective. People didn't necessarily have phones in their home, or if they did, it was a party line where they pick up and it's an operator and the operator has to connect them. I'm not even sure though, 1947, if that was even a thing. I really think that it was, phones were incredibly limited and people were really far away. And for Brazel, this man who is the foreman of the ranch, he's doing all of this on horseback. So, and this is how things were done. So he's out on horseback and he notices there's some stuff on the ground. And so he starts picking it up and he finds this debris field. Now, this is where it's interesting because in this area, he only found bits and pieces of something. I always kind of thought that the story was that the UFO crashed and then that's where everything was found and they were found right away. But that is not true. That is not what happened. So Brazel finds this debris. He picks it up. He takes it home. Meanwhile, UFO sightings are happening all across the U.S. They had a bunch of them in the Inland Northwest. And these are being seen not only by civilians, but these are being seen by military personnel. And they're seeing them fly in formation and they're seeing them fly multiple crafts. So at one point, I believe the most was f a group of five. There was also another report that I found in my research where there was a very large craft that was going over the New Mexico area and it would actually just stop and be stationary. And the thought is, is that these crafts or whatever were looking for their people or their beings that they lost. So all of these sightings are happening and Brazel's like, what the heck's going on? He's like talking to his neighbors. He's showing his neighbors the stuff, this debris he's found. And it's very interesting because it's incredibly thin. It looks like aluminum foil kind of, but it has a different texture. They can't burn it. They crumple it up. And then it, when they release it, it smooths back out. So this is something that they've never seen. They can't destroy it. They're like, what is this? It was so lightweight that, but it had such amazing strength that it wasn't like any other kind of metal that they had ever seen. So Brazel is really curious and he's the one who goes back and makes multiple trips that we're going to talk about on multiple days where he's investigating and looking for more and more things. So that evening he goes back out on the ranch and he finds a 10 foot long piece of debris. In addition to finding a 10 foot long piece of debris, he also finds a gouge in the land that's several hundred feet long. With that gouge and there being minimal debris, I mean, there was debris, but it was very small pieces. The theory and what the clues kind of point to and what the evidence points to, what more than likely happened was this craft came down and it actually hit the ground and that's where that gouge is and that's where the pieces of debris, that first debris field is. But then what happened was it in that impact, it launched itself back up. This would now be the flaming object that the other witnesses saw that was going northeast of Roswell. So what that would mean is, is there would actually be two sites. There would be the initial site where it made the first hit and then bounced back up. And then there would be the second site where everything would ultimately land. So Brazel is just looking at this area, which is the initial impact site, okay? So he's putting all this together. He's like, hmm, this is very weird. Friday, July 4th, 1947. So now we are two days out from the accident. They saw this flaming thing going through the sky on, on Wednesday, July 2nd. Now it's Friday, July 4th. So now we're two days after the initial crash. Brazel, still curious, he goes out again on horseback. This time he takes some different people with him and he goes back out to the debris field. And while he's out there, he sees hawks circling in the sky and he thinks, well, something must have happened to some of the livestock. It must have passed away. So he goes out to investigate to see what's going on. And as they're approaching, they notice a really bad smell. And Brazel reports that he found two bodies that were very small, 
about the size of a child with large heads deceased. And it's reported that he knew that these beings were not of this world. As you can imagine, Brazel is pretty shook up. So he drives into the neighboring city, Corona, because this has all happened northeast of Roswell. This is not in Roswell proper, which I thought everything happened like in Roswell, but it didn't. It's actually way outside of Roswell. So Brazel drives to Corona, which is closer to him than Roswell. And he goes into the general store to call the owner of the ranch, J.B. Foster. And he says, listen, um, I found some debris and I found some dead things on the ranch and I'd like to know what you want me to do. Foster said, you need to call the police and report this. Brazel agrees. Nothing happens on Saturday, July 5th, 1947. Nothing. Nothing is reported. Brazel may have gone back out and investigated. I don't know. But July 5th, nothing of note happened. So now we're at Sunday, July 6th, 1947. Brazel now drives the 75 miles into Roswell with two boxes of debris to share with the sheriff. So you might be asking yourself, why did this guy wait so long to drive into Roswell? Well, keep in mind, this is 1947 and these are people who work out on ranches. Most of the time, people who have ranches or work out there, it's a seven day a week job. Sometimes they would get one day off. What's assumed is that Brazel probably went that day because it was his day off. Most of these people that work the farms, they have these, you know, trucks that are not made for long distances. So it would make sense that it might take him a while to get into town to report this. Sunday, July 6th, Brazel is reporting what he saw to Sheriff Wilcox. Sheriff Wilcox thinks that this is incredible. He has never seen anything like this. He's looking at the debris and he's like, yeah, this is, this is crazy. Brazel leaves and Sheriff Wilcox receives a phone call. Now, 1947, okay, you guys? So the sheriff gets a phone call from a gentleman named Frank Joyce, who is a local reporter. And it was common for Frank Joyce to call the sheriff every day and the sheriff would tell him any important news stories or, or anything that the community needed to know from a sheriff, from the sheriff's office. And then that is what was put in the newspaper. So Frank Joyce just happens to call Sheriff Wilcox right after his conversation with Brazel. And Sheriff Wilcox is like, dude, you don't even know what I just saw, what Brazel brought in here. You need to contact him because this story is huge. And so he gives Joyce a little bit of information. Um, I believe he tells him, hey, he believes he found a crashed spaceship and there's aliens. So Frank Joyce is like, stoked because this is a huge breaking story. But one of the things that Frank Joyce also does while he's on the phone with Sheriff Wilcox is he encourages him to reach out and to call the military. He's like, hey, we need to get the military involved. Sheriff Wilcox makes a call and Major Jesse Marcel is the one who answers the phone and takes the initial report. Marcel reports this to a supervisor and the supervisor then sends Marcel out to investigate with a gentleman named Cabot. So first thing in the morning on Monday, July 7th, Brazel takes Marcel and Cabot out to the wreckage site. So this is the first time anyone from the military has been to this initial wreckage site. While this is happening that same morning, 40 miles northwest of Roswell, there are a group of archaeologists from Texas Tech University. They're out there with their teacher, Professor Holden, and they're just doing some archaeological work. They're looking at different things. And they stumble across something odd. It is an egg-shaped object that looked like it had been through a very rough impact. And what was reported was that they saw three bodies of deceased beings and one being that was still alive and was crouching on a rock and looked scared. This is Monday, July 7th. So this being crashed and was out there for five days. Think about that for just a second. Like, let's just say, just for the sake of this argument, let's say that, that UFOs are real, aliens are real, and that this happened and they crashed in Roswell. There's a lot of evidence that's very convincing of this. But let's say that you are not skeptical and you completely believe this. Man, could you imagine what that being must have been going through? Could you imagine being 
probably injured in a terrible accident and everyone that you're with is dead and you're on a planet that you don't know and there are all kinds of weird things happening i don't know man i just think like i did not realize when i went to roswell because i went to roswell to to research and learn and to have fun but the two things that were just amazing to me were the fact that there were two impact sites i did not know that and the amount of time that passed to do this whole investigation i did not realize that that being was out there for five days could you, oh i can't even i can't even okay i just yeah so professor holden sees this and tells one of his students go to the highway and call somebody call either the police the sheriff call anyone you can get you need to let them know that we need to get people out here so law enforcement is notified it is this afternoon, Monday, July 7th, 1947, when a large group of MPs, engineers, and different select people from the, um, from the military were sent out to the site essentially to gather everything in the area, everything. They were not to leave a scrap of anything. And actually, they used industrial vacuum cleaners to go out to make sure that every single piece of debris was found because the military did not want the story getting out. And the military was already tipped off that the media had been notified because when Sheriff Wilcox calls and reports it, he lets them know, oh, hey, by the way, I told Frank Joyce, the reporter, that he needs to go talk to Brazel, who found all this stuff out on the foster farm. So the military springs to action. They're like, mm -mm, no way, this is not getting out. So they wanted to make sure that every piece of everything was collected. They also then went around to all the different families and threatened them, threatened their lives, that if they ever spoke of it again or told anyone that they would be killed and that their whole families would be killed. I mean, this is like crazy. Brazel was actually taken from the farm and he was kept at a separate location by the military for several days until he was fully interrogated. Um, they brought out Frank Joyce. Frank Joyce was interrogated and then Brazel told, has to tell Frank, hey, that story I told you, no, none of it was true. So there was so much secrecy that went into that. that the secrecy behind the crash is it's own whole video. So I am going to be making several videos on this situation where we deep dive all of the different moving parts of this. But right now, I just really want to look at this timeline. Tuesday, July 8th, 1947, almost a full week later, the bodies that were recovered were finally sent down to Texas where they had a team that was equipped to handle that situation. I believe that there was a very special surgeon that was there and other people that handled top secret stuff. So those are the big points of of the first portion of the timeline of Roswell. So the, the timeline of when the crash happened and when the bodies were recovered and sent out, it was almost a week. That is a long time. So I wanna know what you guys think about this. Do you think aliens are real? Do you think that they actually crashed in Roswell? Did you know that there were two impact sites? And did you know that there were potentially seven beings found and that one of those beings lived for at least five days after the crash because it was found alive. Let me know in the comment section down below. I find this stuff super fascinating. If you want more information on this too, be sure to come back on Friday because I will be posting my travel video for Roswell. So that's going to be really great. It's going to show you all the different places I went. It's going to be less history, less informational, and more of like, this is why you should go to Roswell because Roswell is a really cool place. It's a lot of fun. So definitely stay tuned for that. If you enjoy this kind of content, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. It's a free way for you to help my channel out. And one more time, if you have not already subscribed, please be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you'll be notified every time I upload new content. I was looking at my analytics and like only 1% of the people who watch my videos are subscribed to me. So that means there's like 99% of you that aren't subscribed. So stick around, subscribe, like let's hang out, let's be friends. Let's go on this crazy journey together. I wanna thank you all so much for joining me and hearing this weird piece of history that you never knew that you needed to know. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.